is it clear now is it in the presentation yep. mode yeah good to, good to go thank you all ready okay thank you thank you declan uh, for the introduction and uh, a warm welcome to each and every one of you uh, i thank you for the time that you have given us uh, so just to give a small note of what who hempel is hempel started in 1915 uh, as a coating company in copenhagen in denmark and we have grown uh, into uh, a 1.8 billion uh, euro company uh, uh, we are very very strongly present in the middle east uh, <clears throat> we have a factory in each and every country in the gcc we even have a factory in syria uh, that is still you know continuing to work uh, hempel is owned by the hempel foundation we are not owned by any family nor are we a public listed company uh, so the foundation primarily primarily works on uh, providing education uh, to uh, poor children especially uh, the focus is on girl child education uh, we ran two schools in india currently we run many schools across uh, latin america and africa and also in asia all right so today our discussion is going to be about intumescent coatings uh, intumescent and coatings are primarily to protect structural steel so let me share the agenda we are trying to find out why should we protect steel from fire what are the types of fire we will also get into a little bit of how these coatings work and we will also touch on how to specify and what goes behind and we will also show a few job references of how a good coating should be done and how a coating should be specified correctly we don't want uh, mistakes going through as well the pictures that you will see are primarily from my personal experience and work these are not from google google photos or shutter stock okay so this is a typical fire affected building that you see so what happens is that when there is a fire typically the structure collapses internally and you 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 basically have uh, uh, i'm sorry i'm sorry okay so you you basically have uh, the uh, columns not able to take the load because as the temperature increases the load carrying capacity reduces and once that happens it collapses now when it collapses it always collapses internally right we also have uh, the boundary limit uh, design as well which ensures that you know the fire doesn't spread so most of the time the structure will collapse internally and when it collapses internally it also traps people who are trying to escape so primarily the role of the intumescent coating is to give time for people to escape or go away at the time of fire so primarily this coating is all about saving lives it's all about saving lives but what it would also do for example this structure now this structure is totally damaged there's nothing it can be done the steel is of basically scrap value and nothing more even now if you go this is in qatar right if you go to the salva industrial area the old industrial area uh, this structure the area where the structure is standing now is an empty ground and you know some trucks are standing there in fact the new medical warehouse uh, for the uh, for this company uh, was built and hempel provided the fire protection but what also happens is that the asset is also totally gone there's nothing much we can do about this asset primarily we are here to save people's lives and secondary advantage would be to save or protect the asset now look at this in contrast to this building which is the biggest shopping mall in qatar there was a severe fire which happened and i was called the next day so the fire happened uh, today so i was you know i went in ne next day and uh, i was asked to inspect and see what has happened to the structural steel and as you can see here the structure is intact it has not collapsed it was a major fire 
the escalators and the whole internal structure of the mall was badly damaged but luckily there was no injury there was no fatality as you can see in a close up picture the you 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 can see that you know the complete glass is shattered and you can see that the uh, yeah you 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 can see that the glass is totally shattered you can see the aluminum is melted away but the structural steel is still intact you can see a black char uh, kind of suit which is formed over it and that is basically the intumescent coating working to protect the structural steel passively so we do what is called as passive fire protection here so uh, another close up shot you can see so i am i am actually measuring the depth of the char which is formed so this this measuring unit is about 80 mm so you can see almost 40 mm has gone in right this is the depth into which it has gone so what has happened is that the top coat has withered and then you can see the blisters coming through and the coating expanding to prevent additional heat from going in and affecting the structure you can see this right so you've got your primer this is our primer 17410 and then your intumescent and the top coat so here you can see that some of the intumescent has started to char but uh, but the remaining intumescent is basically there to protect and for addition if additional heat comes in this would start to char as well and this char forms an insulating low thermal conductivity foam thereby protecting the underlying structural steel basically we have two types of fire right when it comes to fire in a civil infrastructure condition in stadiums in shopping malls in hospitals right schools the primary source of the fuel is your upholstery your um, you know cartons your paper right all these basically are the source for the fire and if you see all this they are primarily plant based therefore the fire is called a cellulosic fire in a in an oil and gas in a in a refinery in a uh, in a process industry what you have is you have the fuel source it could be diesel it could be crude it could be uh, you know heavy fuel oil kerosene and in that situation there are two types one where there is a diesel tank and that diesel tank will continue to burn until all the diesel is used up that is what we call as a pool fire but if there is say a petrochemical refinery into which a high pressure uh, you know a feed line is coming through or an offshore platform where uh, you know the crude is coming in at high pressure and when there is fire and at the same time the fuel is coming in at high pressure we call it a jet fire today the discussion is going to focus on cellulosic fire where this is the cellulosic fire curve so within 15 to 20 minutes you can see that the temperature has gone in excess of 700 and it has reached almost 800 degree centigrade okay we can discuss about hydrocarbon fire uh, probably in another session we can talk in detail the fire moves much faster it is more rapid but today our discussion will be focused on cellulosic fire cellulosic fire generally it can be either water based or solvent based cellulosic fire protection system i will explain where water based coating should be used and where solvent based coating should be used and if you use a water based coating system generally the structural steel is located internal up to a maximum of c3 environment as per iso 12944 
If you use a solvent based intumescent coating, then we can go up to C4. So we will continue and share more details on this. So the whole idea behind the fire protection is to give time, right? As I explained to you earlier, we want to ensure that we save lives and we are also trying to protect the asset. So as we discussed, so what you see is that the temperature, this is a fire curve, this is a cellulosic fire curve. So within 15 to 20 minutes, you can see that it has reached almost 800 degrees centigrade. The steel, if unprotected, will reach, will cross 700 degrees centigrade within 10 minutes. But if you protect it with an intumescent coating, we can ensure that it does not exceed 620 degrees centigrade. So steel at 620 degrees centigrade would still have about 40% of its load carrying capacity. Therefore, the structure will not collapse. So you've got two hours. It can, you know, we can change it. It can be 60 minutes, 90 minutes, 120. Sometimes we have worked on projects even two, three hours. Fire protection. So you can see that you still have 40% load carrying capacity. Therefore, the structure does not collapse. And that is how you protect it. So as I said, what we are doing is we are in, we are the specialist in passive fire protection. So what we are basically doing is we are ensuring that there is time for the active fire protection to work. For example, the fire engines, by the time the, the civil defense personnel come, you need time for people to escape. Even if you have a clear path for you know people to escape, where you have a fire execution, uh, uh, evacuation plans and all that, you still need time for people to come out. And passive fire protection systems, like for example, fire doors, right? They also play the same part. So by the time your sprinklers, your uh, fire alarms and your fire extinguisher systems work, this passive fire protection will give time, right? And intumescence obviously is not the only thing. You have boards, you have uh, cementitious material, and you also have your intumescent coatings. The boards are difficult to install. Cementitious material are probably cheap, but they look cheap as well. Right? But structurally, the problem is that both these solutions have a major issue with corrosion. When we do construction, especially in the Middle East, a lot of it is coastal. And corrosion is a major issue. When I started uh, my career in this field of intumescent coating, uh, which is about 18 years ago uh, in Saudi Arabia, and then I moved here to UAE, corrosion was not a major question that people used to ask me. It used to be about the fire protection, what do we do, how does it work? But now, most of the consultants, most of the uh, end users, are now asking, will your coating system provide corrosion protection and fire protection? So it should not be that, you know, you can see that there are gaps here and you can see corrosion starts here. Similarly here, there is corrosion in the interface between this cementitious material and the steel here. So we need to ensure that the system works. After five years, you might have, a, you know, a possible fire or 10 years and the coating should, system should be intact to ensure that the system works. Imagine this, you have a structure, most of the steel structures are now exposed, right? All, all the, wherever you go, airports, you see that, you know, the structure is fully exposed. And imagine trying to put the boards here. It's gonna be extremely difficult to install. And it looks nice, it looks paint-like, aesthetically pleasing when you use a intumescent coating. If you use cementitious material, it doesn't look nice. Aesthetically, it is not pleasing. So if the structure is enclosed, then maybe you can consider, and if it is dry and there is no corrosion, you can consider into uh, cementitious material. But if it is going to be exposed, you want an aesthetically good looking coating finish. At the same time, it should also provide corrosion protection, right? So before I get into the chemistry side of it, I would like to show 
a small video of how the intumescent coating works. This video is taken in our Barcelona lab. You will see an eye section connected to thermocouples here. And you see, this is the air temperature, the ambient temperature in the oven. And you can see the coating here is expanding. And we are measuring the internal steel temperature here using this thermocouple. And you can see that even though the temperature reaches even 900 degrees centigrade, the structure still stands. It has not collapsed. And you see that the coating has fully expanded. So what basically happens? So after 1000 degrees, I think we lost our camera also. Right? So what basically happens here is that you have your steel. There is a primer applied and then the intumescent is applied. So as the temperature increases, so typically there is the binder system is used to spread the coating, right? So typically for a cellulosic intumescent coating, you will have an acrylic binder, say like a water-based uh, binder or a solvent-based binder. And then you have a catalyst like ammonium polyphosphate. When the metal, when the steel reaches a temperature of 200 degrees centigrade, the catalyst triggers an acid reaction and slowly this carbon source, a material like penta erythritol, it starts to give out carbon. So slowly carbon starts coming out because of this catalyst acid reactions. And this blowing agent, like melamine, it starts to give out small bubbles of inert gas, like nitrogen. And this bubble, along with the carbon material, slowly move up. It pushes up and forms an insulating foam. So heat coming in from the outside, the heat coming in from the outside will not go in directly and it will not go quickly. So it will retard, it will slow down. So this is an insulating foam that is formed. And this foam will ensure that that steel does not reach the critical temperature. Yeah. So this is primarily what, what we are doing here. Let me show you another short video. It will help you, uh, you know, pick up. Uh, just watch the intermission coating applied here on the plate. This typically this is what happens, right? You have heat coming in from the outside on the coating and just see what happens to the coating. You can see that the coating slowly expands and the expansion is usually 40 to 60 times its original thickness. If you have applied one millimeter thick coating, it will expand to about 40 to 60 millimeters. It is red hot on the outside, but you can still see that the char is a stable char and it prevents the heat from blowing inside. All right. So this intumescent coating can be applied on any type of structure, whether it is hollow sections, such as the circular, square and rectangular, or you know any of the open sections. Right? It can be applied, the coating can be applied at the factory or after erection is done. Now, let us go and check how we calculate, right? So, so when we look at these two steel sections, one is thin, another one is thick. At a time of heat, at the time of fire, what we know is the thinner section will heat up faster than the thicker section. So I need to protect the thinner section with more paint while the thicker section can receive a lesser coating thickness. We call this as section factor or massivity of steel. So thinner sections and or thicker sections we design something called as HP by A. 
it's primarily the heated perimeter if, if this for example is a column right all four sides are exposed to potential fire so heated perimeter divided by the cross sectional area so you get a certain number lower the number lower the thickness higher the number higher the thickness so 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 if the if the, if the area is more that means the it is more massive so your hp by a is smaller so the thickness you can apply is smaller as well right so just a small calculation as engineers we like to do this calculation so this is a four side exposed column okay so all four sides fire can come so it is called four side exposed and this is the area right so the heated perimeter is 1.14 meters the area okay is 0 0.0053 square meters you divide the heated perimeter by the area you get 212 the same section it's got concrete on top so that means there is no heat coming in it's only three side exposed so what happens your area remains the same but the perimeter reduces therefore you have a lower number so in this situation i can apply slightly less thickness here i have to apply more thickness here so unlike your protective coating system where you say 50 microns primer 100 microns mid coat 50 microns top coat no with intumescent coatings we have to understand the section details the section sizes and then we would be able to tell you what is the coating thickness required so when you do a specification what basically happens is first we need to identify what is the fire duration the critical temperature normally it is given as 550 550 degrees centigrade for columns and 620 degrees centigrade for beams with concrete on top three side exposed beams with concrete on top then we will calculate the section factor you don't have to do all this we can do this we check this what type of section it is and what is also important is to know the corrosivity category this will help determine the type of intumescent that you can use this is a typical third party test report right we use ap plus so for example if your section factor is 100 and you want to protect the steel to 120 minutes you have to apply 1.79 millimeter of coat the same section you want to protect it for one hour you can apply only 0.4 millimeters the same section you want to protect for three hours then you do five millimeters 5.08 okay so this is a third party test uh, test report and usually civil defense looks into these and they approve the product to be used all right so how do we specify if the corrosion environment is c1 you can up steel into uh, primer and then into mesen. you know water based into mesen. you can give a water based into mesen, such as optima 500 you don't even need a top coat if it is c2 you know it is air conditioned you know it is it is uh, uh, you know humidity controlled in the in 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 the middle east if you go to europe then you talk about heated buildings correct so then if it is only c2 fairly well controlled uh, humidity then steel primer water based intumescent and a water based top coat a simple acrylic top coat that we use for you know our uh, uh, protecting our uh, decorating our walls would be good enough but if it is a c3 the steel is internal but it is not in the air conditioned or heated envelope it is outside subject to lot of humidity and and uh, possible corrosion then we would recommend that you put a polyurethane top coat one single coat of polyurethane at 100 microns if it is in a c4 environment then you might want to add like a zinc rich primer and then you put your intumescent top coat right a solvent based intumescent and then a top coat so this this is what right we do all right but what is also important <clears throat> what is also important is to ensure that we apply the correct coating in the correct environment so what you see here this is again a large shopping mall in qatar now you will see a lot of qatar examples because i lived uh, about seven years in qatar uh, before i moved back for my second uh, say, phase of uh, uae 
so you can see that the structure, the, the steel inside, right? That this is the close-up shot. So the steel, they said, oh, it is internal. Nothing to worry, it's internal. And they applied a water-based intumescent. And you can see that within a year's time, it started to get damaged because water-based intumescents tend to absorb a lot of moisture. They tend to absorb a lot of moisture. So this does is not covered. Okay. So this is a ground level parking. So what happened? All the humidity went in and it started to damage the coating. Even now, if you go there, you will be able to see. Our recommendation was for a solvent-based system. The customer did not accept. They went in with this. And now, this place is compromised. If there is a fire, the whole structure is going to collapse because the right coating was not used. So, this is what we would say as semi-exposed. If it is fully closed and enclosed, then that's fine. But because it is semi-exposed, you are going to have a problem of humidity coming in, especially in July and August. Another example, which is closer to home, right? So this is in Oman, Salala Airport. A lot of people say, oh, you know, we applied water-based and then we put a top coat. Not one, but two top coats we applied. It should protect the intumescent underneath. No, it does not protect. You see this? The intumescent is peeling off and you can see these bubbles coming out and these are basically on the top coat. You can see that this is a gray top coat. And you can still see that, you know, there are a lot of bubbles coming in. A recent inquiry that we got in Dubai. Again, they applied water-based intumescent. And you can see there is no corrosion. The primer still seems okay. But you can see that the water-based intumescent starts to fall off. A closer shot. You can see that it tends to fall. So very important that we select the right product for the right environment and Hempel is here to help you and support you and give you details on how the application can be done and what is the right methodology and what is the right application to be done. Where it should be applied, where, where can we use water-based, where can we use solvent-based. And Hempel does provide end-user support. For example, the project that you are currently running, how would you know if it is in a C1, C2, C3, C4, or C5 environment. Himpel can help you with that. We have done several projects where we have gone in and supported the, the, the uh, because the definition is very, very clear. For example, CX is the worst environment. So the whole world is divided into six categories as per ISO 12944. C1 being the least corrosive, probably the hills of Lebanon or, a, you know, a rural place. CX is the offshore platform. So how do you define CX? If you take a piece of metal, carbon steel, and leave it outside, after one year, if you come and inspect, the loss of metal due to corrosion in one annum, in one, during, in, in 365 days, if it is between 200 to 700 microns, 0.2 to 0.7 millimeters, then it is CX environment. If the corrosion loss of the metal in one year is between 80 to 200 microns, it is defined as C5 environment. If it is between 30 to 50 microns metal loss, it is C4 environment. This is how we define corrosion, protection, uh, corrosivity environment. Now, this kind of data is not available for many of our projects here. But Hempel can help you with our expertise. I'm a certified protective coating specialist as well. We can help you using standards such as ISO 9223 to identify the location that your project is currently in and where, which product can be used where correctly. So now this is a few examples of what we have done. This is in Oman. Uh, this is the uh, hospital in Muscat. 
this is a warehouse in uh, Qatar. This one single warehouse, we used about 225,000 liters of intermessive coating here. This warehouse was being built for the pr in, in preparation of the World Cup. Uh, Palestinian and Sudani school, and we've got a lot of other, uh, you know, uh, details, a lot of other uh, projects uh, that we have done. We have also done uh, many projects in the UAE as well, right? So Hempel, uh, we are doing a lot of work in PFP uh, coatings, uh, and we have new projects, uh, new products coming through. There are several new uh, testings that we provide, for example, lead, right? You want uh, EPDs, uh, right? So we can help you with all those to meet your project requirements. All right. So we can we can help you with that. So thank you very much. Uh, I end my presentation here and would be happy to take any questions if there are. Um, Declan, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Manoj, for that uh, very clear and informative uh, presentation. Um, just if there is any of the attendees, if you have any questions, please feel free to, uh, to type them uh, into the box. Um, in the meantime, uh, Manoj, I actually have, have a question that that caught my attention in your in your slides. Um, being an engineer, I thought that the difference in thickness of intermessing coating between one hour and two hour fire protection would be just double. Um, but uh -huh. I noticed from the table that it's a, a lot more than that. It's quite quite significant. Um, have you got any more information on how how that is? Uh, okay. okay. See, what happens is that you know when we do this testing. Right, so there are about uh, four standards that you know world over people use commonly. Okay, you have BS four seven six part twenty, which is a very part twenty twenty one, which is a very common standard used here in the Middle East as well and in the UK. Then Europe now gets into another standard called EN one three three eight one. In the US, you have standards like UL two six three and ASTM E one one nine. Right, so each one of these standards, what they do is they will uh, apply a certain amount of coating, it goes to the oven, they will connect thermocouples and then they will measure that for a certain applied thickness, what is the internal temperature, okay? So this is how we do it. So when you consider uh, the temperature and the fire protection required for one hour, two hours and three hours, what happens is 60 minutes is a certain time limit where you can apply a lower thickness and get away with the protection. But as soon as you move from 60 to 120 minutes, then the stress on the, on the steel is way higher. So in order to protect it, okay, and, and when you expose it for a long time, steel absorbs that you know, latent heat. So to prevent it, what we do is we have to apply higher thickness. So a lot of times what I've seen is you take a two-hour project, you take a one-hour project. The one hour is probably a quarter of the two hour right and yes. now the, yeah so now the question is should you protect it for two hours or should you protect it for one hour so that decision is primarily down to the <clears throat> uh, civil defense a lot of times they will have certain you know criterion they might say that there are certain warehouses which are having flammable material, then you need to you know, protect it for two hours. Occupancy is also another important factor. If there are only two people in the whole building, they can come out, right? So you can even, <clears throat> we, we did a project recently for Dukum refinery. They, they needed only half an hour fire protection. Okay. 30 minutes, right? Because all the evacuation plans were clear and it was a, it was a maintenance building. And they did not uh, envisage anything more than five to ten people at any point of time in the building. So that was good enough for them. So that will depend on this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a few questions coming in, so we'll we'll take them uh, one by one. So um, 
Shapur uh, is is asking, uh, can you give any information about the cost uh, and time required to to apply? All right, okay. Uh, cost, uh, okay, would be difficult because it depends on the thickness and the size of the steel. But uh, what generally happens is that there are two ways this coating is done. Either the steel fabricator applies the primer and then he applies the intumescent coating and then he ships it to the project sites and erects it. Or what, what can also happen is the primer is done at the projects at the uh, yard and then the material moves, they erect it and then they put it up and then they do the coating after the erection is done. So each one has its advantages. When you erect it and then paint it, the manpower and time might be a little more, but the damages are less. But if you do it at the factory and it comes in, the erection damages on the coating is more and we can do it. A one hour project can okay cost uh, so something like 80 dirhams okay, uh, per square meter, but it will obviously, these are all ballpark figures I'm giving you. Uh, uh, a two hour could be, you know, closer to, uh, you know, 200 uh, dirhams as well. You, you know, if this is between 50 to 80, that could be from uh, 150 to 200. And what also happens is that, you know, so one, one hour project can be done faster, a two hour would be taking more time because you have to build higher thickness. But what is also important is to understand the top coat. Hempel requires only one top coat. Other leading manufacturers might need two top coats, so it takes more time. So these are all different nuances that you know might affect it. But I'm sure we can fit it within the overall project uh, time frame. It can be done. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is from Yaswant. Um, just. How does the exposed area of the fire, how does that decide the thickness? Um, like whatever the exposed area, the impact of the flame would be the same, or is it? Uh, okay, okay. So so I think what he's also talking about is three-sided and four-sided, right? So, uh, and we know that, uh, you know, st steel conducts. So what is a big deal, right? What is the difference? Mm -hmm. what, but what we are looking at here is the, impact which happens. So if it is uh, a three-sided beam with concrete on top, so what happens is not only does the concrete prevent heat coming in from to one side, but yes, you know, heat is coming in from the bottom and the three sides, but the concrete also acts like a heat sink. So because of which you can slightly increase your critical temperature or your failure temperature. So a column which is four-sided column you will protect it to 550 degrees centigrade using prescriptive method. But a beam, which is three-side exposed with concrete on top, very clearly, yeah, with concrete on top, you will then protect it to 620 degrees centigrade. If it is not concrete and if it is just, uh, you know, open or a metal, a thin roofing sheet, then you need to protect it for four sides. And what Yeshwan says is correct. But if it's got concrete, then it acts as a heat sink. Okay, and the next question from Ahmed. Um, what's the difference in the cost between intumescent coating and cementitious material? Uh, I guess that's the spray, the spray on <laughs> one. <laughs> all right, okay. See, uh, comparing these two are, you know, like apples and oranges, all right? So each one has its place. So if you are in a dry area, if it is not exposed or Ikea car park, you know, they don't care. Even if it is exposed, they don't really care about, you know, how the finish looks, uh, right? Uh, there, cementitious can be used. But in areas where it is exposed, you will still, you know, go with it. What I have seen uh, is it's, it's, uh, it ranges between uh, uh, 50 to 80% of the intumescent cost, the, uh, the cementitious. But that is because in the Middle East, we still have cheap labor coming in from Asia and Africa. If you go to Europe, for example, this difference is not as much. In fact, sometimes cementitious material is costlier because it is very, very labor intensive. And it is very difficult to apply and then remove, uh, you know, the, 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 the removal itself is very, very uh, time consuming and costly. So that's how it, uh, the economics play. Okay, thank you. And um, another question, uh, what's the typical lifespan and general O&M strategy at the end of the first 
the first lifespan. All right. Okay. Generally, these are reactive coatings. So as long as the coating is intact and without any mechanical damage, nothing is going to happen. It's not like after 10 years, you have to recoat it. No, it doesn't happen like that. In fact, there are, uh, if it is like a controlled environment internally, we even give lifetime uh, warranties, right? Durability, we say, as long as the structure is safe and, you know, sound, our coating will work. There's absolutely no problem. It's only when, you know, there are external. So, so uh, I have been in this field, as I said, you know, for about 18 years. I have not come across any project where I have had to recoat it because, you know, it is damaged or it is not effective. If there is a fire accident, then yes, you have to uh, blast clean and then recoat it. That's a totally different scenario. There. Okay. Okay. Um, and the next question from Sama. Um, how does uh, uh, strength design, like any reserve capacity, how does that affect the thickness of the paint? Okay, that's a great question. In fact, I wanted to touch it up in a thing. Hempel, we do a lot of uh, work on fire design. Probably, you know, if there is another opportunity, I will get our structural engineer, uh, who's a chartered engineer, and he's also a member of the Institute of Fire Engineers, who, who can come and give a topic, uh, a talk purely on fire design. Okay, how we can calculate limit state design at the time of fire, where we can use EN1993, BS5950 standards, and how we can do, right? When we typically look at uh, the capacity utilization, for example, uh, right, we've calculated live load, dead load, seismic load, wind load, right, uh, snow load, whatever, right? And then we know that we need 80 kilo newton load. Uh, 80 kilo newton is the, lo is the load that is coming in. So the engineer designs it for 100 kilo newton. So it is, it is protected for only 80% capacity utilization. So it's only 80%. So the temperature that I talked about, columns 550 degrees centigrade, beams 620 degrees centigrade, is based on 100% utilization. As soon as you say it is only 80% utilized, we can increase the failure temperature and thereby reduce the thickness. And there is a lot of value engineering that we can bring to you and your end user through this. So Hempel can provide a, a lot of support in fire engineering. The thickness will greatly reduce. As the capacity utilization is reduced, the thickness can be reduced. Yes, yes, I can, I can see a, an opportunity there for sure, yes. Um, okay, uh, next question is from uh, Hussein. Um, does Hempel conduct any analysis uh, to arrive to the original coating thickness in case of pool or jet fire in a hydrocarbon facility? Are some specific data required to be shared to arrive at that thickness? All right, okay. Generally, what happens is uh, the uh, facilities, right, the refineries, they will have their defined criteria, right? What they will say is, here I have a tank, a diesel tank, and uh, the area surrounding it, we want to protect it to pool fire. But there might be a process pipeline coming in and there you need jet fire protection. Sometimes the refinery would also say that within a certain vicinity, I need pool fire protection for two hours and jet fire protection for one hour. So based on the loss prevention, uh, people working, they will define these criteria. Normally, a coating supplier is not asked to evaluate this. We might be able to suggest something, but these are already preset, either based on the API, American Federal Institute standards, or the experience of the refinery themselves. For example, ad hoc, ad hoc they will simply say, I, you know, even if it is pool fire, they will, not say, they will say two hours pool fire, one hour jet fire. They want combination. But somebody might say, I just want pool fire, pool fire protection because I don't have anything pressurized here. And if it is offshore, you definitely have to go with the uh, jet fire protection system. So that's that's how generally it uh, protects. Okay, thank you. Um, so Shapur has got a just a follow up question. I think uh, he asked the first question about the the time and cost. Um, yeah. And we touched on the the the, the cost. But as regards the time, like uh, to to install these coatings, either in the factory or, or during construction? Yeah. 
Uh, all right. See, the time uh, again. It depends on how many people are you know uh, employed and you know how how things uh, get done. I was showing you the picture of uh, the warehouse where we applied two hundred and twenty-five thousand liters. The large warehouse where we applied. I think the whole coating was. Uh, we we completed the project in uh, forty-five days time, right? And you can again, it can go up or come down depending on the number of people. For example, there are certain projects. Uh, I think recently there was a vaccine center in Abu Dhabi. I think they employed like twelve crews. I was like, my gosh, you know, they were painting over each other kind of thing. But it was a vaccine center, so it had to be, had to be you know, started quickly. So and that was done, you know, very very quickly. It was a large vaccine center in Abu Dhabi, and it was done quickly, right? So that that depends on uh, you know the number of crews uh, that you employ, and we can get it done. Okay. Okay. Um... I think that's that's all the questions in the chat box, but uh, there's one or two things I wanted to just uh, maybe bring up for discussion. There was a couple of photographs there with the where where the water based uh, intramesin coating was used in an external environment, um, and I, I guess the alternative to that is is a, an oil based uh, yeah. coating. Is it? Yeah. So, is there any? disadvantages to the oil-based uh, coating? Okay, yeah. See, uh, the solvent-based coating, probably that is also another uh, you know, uh, topic that we could discuss in length, you know, durability of intumescent coatings. I recently presented a paper in a NACE conference. Now, NACE is called AMPP now, called FireCore, and I'll be more than happy to share with you because that is also an area because corrosion uh, is coming in you know, very, very strongly now. Yes. The water-based intumescent and solvent-based, if you compare, the solvent based gives better durability and normally with that comes the higher cost right but when you consider the lifetime definitely right uh, the solvent based is worth the money number one number two in a middle eastern environment uh, where the temperatures are very high the solvent based coating usually takes a little longer to finish the coating application uh, because you know the solvent because all these coatings are what we call as physically drying. The solvent or the water has to ev evaporate from the film for it to dry. So it takes a little longer. So what you have to do is you have to select the right product because a product uh, such as hemp pills, we can apply at a high thickness. So what happens is you can save time. So uh, the, the applicator goes, he applies high thickness in one area, then goes around, finishes, and by the time he comes, it is ready to take the next coat. So that only two disadvantages are that uh, the, the material is slightly costlier and uh, the application time is a little longer. But other than that, it works fine and it's, uh, and it's well worth uh, the problem of having to repair, right? Yes, that is yes. even costlier, more time consuming, and it, uh, it results in uh, major, major problems. So, mm -hmm. so we don't... Uh, we, and, and now there, there are new products which come in which will also give you very, very, uh, you know, competitive uh, thickness and the loading as well. So that is also coming through. Okay, thank you. Um, in in a lot of factories, warehouses, you've got the the main steelwork running through the roof, and you got the insulated uh, panels on top. But yeah. you also have the small, we call them purlins. They're the silver yeah. guys. Yeah, yeah. That are only a one to two millimeters thick. Uh, yeah. Have you ever had? consultants specifying those to be also fire protected okay generally you protect only the load carrying primary members okay mm. and the secondary load transfer members can also be protected but the z perlins primarily they are mostly z perlins they are yeah. tertiary they are tertiary members and only protecting you know who supporting the roof on top you don't need to protect them in fact right. uh, recently i think i did a presentation and one of the consultants wanted me to give in writing how to go back to the end user and tell him you don't need to protect it. You know? yeah. So we, we did give, give some details. So yeah, but we don't need to. And uh, need it, to. yeah, we don't need to protect it. Okay. Okay. That's good. Um, just another note in the questions is if, if you can share your, your contact details or your, your email address so that um, uh, people sure. will be able to make contact with you. The, the, this, um, this webinar is, going to be broadcast on youtube and it'll be there for for future reference as well so. yeah so let me i'm putting it on the chat box i hope everybody is able to see that
mobile number. Yeah, I guess I will have to reshare it again to, to everyone. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so the, actually the final question, because uh, there's a lot of talk about sustainability recently. Yes. Um, so yeah. You mentioned uh, EPDs, that's uh, yeah. environmental pr protection data sheets or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a directive, yeah. Um, so have you got, like, like if someone asked you what's the embodied carbon of, of your product, would you be able to yeah. give that advice? Yes, yes. You know, we, we can do that. Uh, what what we have done uh, is that it, it's a system uh, driven thing right so you also have your primer you have your intermescent and then you have your top coat so for example if somebody wants lead certification gsas in qatar estadama right um, in 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 abu dhabi now i think dubai has got al safat right and yes, we yeah. can help you right we can help you with all these things so so we work with customers depending I, in fact, now people are asking about, uh, you know, uh, in, indoor comfort, right? That's a, that's a new standard people are coming in with, right? Yes, and they yes. want to measure what is your emission at day three, what is your emission at day 28, day 14, and they want to know how, how these things work. Uh, so we, at Hempel, we can provide a lot of details. Uh, in fact, we can even provide a complete system if it is totally internal. We can go with a primer, which is normally applied at the factory, then you, a water-based intermescent, and we can even provide a water-based polyurethane. It will have less than 50 grams or 60 grams uh, per uh, liter as the VOC, and we'll be compliant right through and through. And especially for projects where you know, you're know you going to do uh, application at site, uh, these things definitely help. Uh, VOC and you know environmental protection is a major, major thing. Yes. Okay. Um, I think that's uh, that's all the questions um, answered, and uh, very good timing, actually. Uh, so thanks again, Manuj, for for taking the time to um, to 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 let us know all about uh, your 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 products. It's it's it was very informative. Um, so just to just to note uh, to everyone, keep an eye out for our April uh, CPD session. Just to have a look on LinkedIn or our social media.